Okay, good, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our 2020 Hot Topics Lecture Series from the Environmental Law Center at Vermont Law School. I'm Jenny Rushlow. I'm the Director of the Environmental Law Center and the Associate Dean for Environmental Programs here at Vermont Law School. And I'm gonna bring up a list of resources on the screen here to direct you to some of the programs that we have at the Environmental Law Center, for those of you looking to learn more. Um, you can also view our full Hot Topics lineup by going to the website, vermontlaw.edu backslash hot dash topics. Each talk in the Hot Topics lecture series is worth one Vermont CLE credit. So if you're um, wanting to get CLE credit for these lectures, please keep track of which talks you attend for your records. There will be time at the end of the lecture for questions and answers today. So please type your questions in the chat box. You can do that at any time during the lecture and we'll get to as many of you as we can um, with the remaining time at the end of the lecture today. Today, we are very pleased to feature our own professor at Vermont Law School, Pat Parento. Pat is a professor of law and senior counsel in the Environmental Advocacy Clinic here at VLS. He previously served as director of the Environmental Law Center from 1993 to 1999, and he was the founding director of our Environmental Advocacy Clinic under its previous name, Environmental and Natural Resources Clinic, which was founded in 2004. Pat has an extensive background in environmental and natural resources law. Previously, he served as VP for conservation at the National Wildlife Federation, Regional Council to the New England Regional Office of EPA, Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, and Senior Counsel at Perkins Coie in Portland. Pat has been involved in drafting, litigating, implementing, teaching, and writing about environmental law and policy for over three decades. And he's currently focused on the challenges of climate change through his teaching, his publishing, public speaking, and litigation. His talk today is called Clean Water Act Update, the Maui Decision, WOTUS Wars Part Two, World's Worst Copper Mine, and more. We're delighted to have you here, Pat. Take it away. Thanks, Jenny, and welcome everyone. I, I hope you're all doing well. Before I launch into this, um, it would I would be remiss uh, if I weren't to note the extraordinary circumstances uh, we find ourselves in in the country right now. Um, we're facing three traumas. The, the obvious pandemic with the coronavirus, the fact that 43 million Americans are out of work, uh, the virus has killed 110,000 Americans, and it's still rampant in the country in many parts. Um, and now, of course, the horrific killing um, in Minneapolis of George Floyd um, by four officers of the Minneapolis Police Department, which has unleashed the kinds of protests I haven't seen since the 1960s um, in the country. The difference being, I would say, that there's at least hope that maybe we have, in fact, reached a really significant tipping point in this country and that we are finally prepared to deal with the systemic problem of racism in America, which manifests itself in all three of the traumas the country's going through. And what I will simply say about this is environmental law has a role to play in all of these challenges, a positive role a constructive role. Climate justice is racial justice. Um, we now have, thanks to Jenny, an environmental justice clinic uh, with the wonderful Marianne Lotto Engelman running it and our students working on it. So I'm proud to say that Vermont Law School is at the forefront of dealing with the twin challenges of uh, these environmental uh, and health catastrophes uh, but also the justice, the fundamental concept of justice. And with that, let me turn to uh, my presentation uh, of four uh, specific issues, recent developments under the Clean Water Act. This is, this is an ambitious agenda. I'm not sure we'll be able to do justice, uh, speaking of justice, to it all. 
um, but we'll try. So the first one we're going to talk about, let's go to Maui. Wouldn't we all like to do that? Um, and this is the famous uh, county of Maui versus Hawaii Wildlife Fund case and the decision of the United States Supreme Court just this spring. Um, the question presented was, when does the discharge of treated effluent uh, from a sewage treatment plant, and you're looking at the Maui sewage treatment plant, which injects the wastewater into the groundwater, which then flows, in this case, one half mile to the Pacific Ocean. Um, does that, when does that require a permit under the Clean Water Act? It's an indirect discharge question. We know that direct discharges are always regulated when they come through a pipe that goes directly into the surface water. But this is a question about when the pollutants in question are traveling through the groundwater, uh, under what circumstances would that still require a permit? This particular activity in Hawaii and Maui has been ongoing for a number of years. There's been lots of studies of the marine waters that have been impacted. Here's a shot. Uh, of what is the damage that's being done to the coral reef uh, that is receiving all of this effluent. This beach is also a very popular swimming and surfing beach. This is Hawaii after all. Um, and so a lot of the local people who use the beach are quite concerned about both the damage being done and the health effects of the sewage effluent reaching the waters that they use and, and enjoy and, and swim in. The Supreme Court, in what some might have considered a somewhat surprising decision, primarily because it was a six to three majority decision, um, ruled that under certain circumstances, indirect discharges like Maui can require a permit under the Clean Water Act. And Justice Breyer has now come up with a new test for when indirect discharges are regulated and as he puts it, a permit is required when there is a direct discharge from a point source into navigable waters or where there is the functional equivalent of a direct discharge. So once again, we have the Supreme Court coming up with its own test for how the law should be interpreted and applied. It has echoes of what the Supreme Court did in the infamous Rapanos case dealing with the jurisdictional scope of the Clean Water Act, about which we'll be talking more in a moment. Um, and in that case, Justice Kennedy famously came up with his significant nexus test to determine when headwaters and wetlands would be subject to the Clean Water Act. So now we have a brand new test um, that Judge Justice Breyer has developed and has convinced six of his five of his colleagues to agree with, including significantly Chief Justice Roberts and even Justice Kavanaugh, uh, who joined with the majority decision in this case. Um, Justice Breyer has tried to explain what this functional equivalent test means by listing a whole bunch of factors that the court should consider. Rather than simply saying whether the discharge that was occurring in Maui is the functional equivalent of, an in, of a direct discharge. The court ducked that question and that decision and sent it back down to the lower courts. The Ninth Circuit has sent it all the way back to the district court in Hawaii. So these seven factors that you're looking at are going to be, if this case proceeds to trial, there's still a chance it may settle. But if it goes to trial, these are the factors that the lower court is now going to have to consider. And you can see there, two of them are obvious. Transit time, how long does it take the pollutants to travel from the point source through the groundwater into the surface water? The distance traveled, how far away in Maui, it's a half a mile. The nature of the material through which the pollutant travels, sort of like the geologic formation. Uh, the extent to which the pollutant is diluted or changed chemically as it moves. The amount of pollutant entering the navigable waters relative to the amount of pollutant leaving the point source, the manner by or area in which the pollutant enters the navigable waters, a very ambiguous concept, and seven, the degree to which the pollution has maintained its specific 
identity. And Justice Breyer says, time and distance will be the most important factors in most cases, not necessarily every case, which brings us to the next case that's gonna to have to wrestle with this functional equivalent test. And that's the Kinder Morgan versus Upstate Forever case in the Fourth Circuit. This case was also pending in the Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court put a hold on the case pending the decision in Maui. Now that they've issued the Maui decision, they vacated the lower court, in this case, the Fourth Circuit decision in Kinder Morgan, and sent it back to the lower courts to determine uh, whether or not um, this kind of activity requires a permit. In the Kinder Morgan case, we're talking about an underground gas pipeline that split, that broke, and leaked into the groundwater a very substantial amount, over 200,000 gallons of gasoline before it was finally discovered and the leak was stopped. And this gasoline is in the groundwater and moving through um, uh, wetlands and streams into two receiving waters, which are waters of the United States covered by the Clean Water Act. The Fourth Circuit said, that's an indirect discharge that requires a permit. If time and distance are the primary criteria, then it may very well result in a decision that this kind of a leak from a pipeline um, would require a permit because this leak was only uh, 400 feet from one of the streams and 1,000 feet from another. Um, and the gasoline doesn't change in any meaningful way as it moves through the groundwater. Uh, it doesn't change in character or effect. Uh, it's visible on the surface water as a sheen. And it was discovered within months of the leak by this group, Upstate Forever, uh, which documented the effects. The problem I see here is this was an accident. This was a, maybe it was foreseeable, maybe not, but it was an accident. Um, not an intentional act like Maui, it isn't, and it isn't ongoing. The leak was fixed. What's happening is it's a plume of contaminated groundwater that's moving into surface water. So I have to rate this as a what I call a jump ball. I'm not sure how the Fourth Circuit and the lower courts are going to deal with this functional equivalent test, but that's the next case to watch. And then in a related area, you're looking at the Dominion Energy Power Plant in Virginia, and that large black area you see on your screen uh, to my right uh, of the plant itself is a coal ash impoundment. That's what you do with the residue of coal when it's burned to generate electricity. You have a massive amount of what some would call toxic coal ash. It does contain heavy metals in various concentrations, so it could fairly be considered toxic depending on the dose and the concentration and what it's affecting. But you see how close it is to the river here. And what's happening, of course, is these are these pits are unlined. They're, they're not hazardous waste sites. They're not regulated that way. They are regulated under the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, RICRA, but the states are the ones that are responsible for non-hazardous waste. This has been declared not to be hazardous waste. So these pits all over the country, particularly in the south, southeast, are leaking like crazy and causing all kinds of pollution problems. Question here is when it's just passively leaking out of the bottom of this lagoon, this pit, is that a discharge? Is that going to meet the functional equivalent of a direct discharge? So that's another uh, series of cases to look at. The Fourth Circuit and the Sixth Circuit have reached conflicting views on this, but with this new test, those are going to have to be relitigated in some cases. And it comes down to this essential question of what does the concept of conveyance, that's the way a point source is defined in the Clean Water Act, what does that mean in this context? The dictionary definition you see is the action or process of transporting someone or something from one place to another. It sort of implies an active transport as opposed to passive. So that may turn out to be a key question in whether this kind of activity is regulated as a point source discharge. Shifting gears, let's now talk about WOTUS, Waters of the United States, and the infamous WOTUS wars, which have been going on for over 10 years, ever since the Rapanos decision. 
Um, and now we're entering part two or part two, if you will. Uh, we've had one round of WOTUS wars when the Obama administration promulgated the 2015 rule defining the term, or re redefining the term waters of the United States pretty broadly, not as broadly as some had argued, but certainly much broader than what this current administration could um, accept. Um, and so now we have what's called the navigable waters protection, and I put that in air quotes rule. And um, um, so now we're launching into a, a whole new war and battle in, in the lower courts. The Supreme Court has said reviews of this kind of a rule, um, waters of the United States definition rule, um, even though it's nationwide and even though it has major impact, um, is not reviewed in the courts of appeal, as some other Clean Water Act rules are, but rather has to be reviewed in the district courts. And so there are now five lawsuits pending in five district, dis different federal district courts uh, on both sides. You know, the cattlemen have gone to court in New Mexico uh, saying the Trump administration didn't go far enough in redefining this term water to the U.S. State of California and 17 other states have gone to the Northern District of California to sue challenging the Trump rule. Environmental groups uh, led by the S Southern Environmental Law Center have filed in South Carolina, and I know there are other cases in the works. What the Trump rule does in, in uh, simplest form is it eliminates the protections of the Clean Water Act, not, not just for discharge permits or for dredge fill disposal permits under 404, but virtually for everything under the Clean Water Act, hazardous and oil spills, water quality standards, total maximum daily loads, all of the different tools and mechanisms of the Clean Water Act only apply if it's truly waters of the United States. The Trump rule reduces by the best estimates that we can get, about 20 percent of the tributaries and streams of the United States from federal protection. These are typically headwater streams, intermittent streams in many cases, channelized streams that are artificial streams now because they've been ditched over the years. Um, the Trump rule automatically excludes everything that it calls ephemeral streams. These are streams that only have water in them in response to major rain events um, and are mostly dry most of the time. Significance of that, of course, as you might imagine, in the arid Southwest is that Arizona has determined approximately 93% of the water courses in Arizona are no longer covered by the Clean Water Act. So it's having dramatic effects in different parts of the country on streams. The other and even bigger impact is on wetlands. And the Trump rule eliminates federal protection for roughly 50% of the remaining wetlands in the nation. And we've already lost over 50% of our wetlands. So this is a very dramatic impact um, on what are considered to be incredibly important biological resources, but also uh, water quality maintenance uh, uh, systems. They, they soak up a lot of pollution, uh, they settle sediments, they slow down erosion and so forth, performing all kinds of critical water quality and biological and, not to mention, carbon sequestration functions. And the Trump administration is eliminating protection from federal law for 50 percent. Um, that wouldn't be so bad, perhaps, if, if in fact the states could pick up the slack. That's one of the things the Trump administration is arguing will happen as a result of their rule that the states will simply fill the gaps. Not true. The Environmental Law Institute's done a study that shows 26 states have laws on the books prohibiting them from regulating any waters that are not regulated under the Clean Water Act. And many other states have all kinds of procedural barriers to states uh, enacting these kinds of regulations, including protection of property rights and other things. So it is by no means clear that states even have the legal authority to pick up the slack, let alone the institutional 
capacity and capability of doing so. So these cases are now all in litigation. Uh, they'll be there for the balance of the Trump administration's term, hopefully single term. Um, and a lot of these issues will be kicked forward into the next administration. The biggest legal questions here are how to interpret waters of the U.S. The 2015 rule relied on Justice Kennedy's significant nexus test. And the reason for that is because all 10 of the circuit courts that interpreted the Rapanos decision used Kennedy's test as the main test to determine whether a water met this significant nexus requirement. No circuit court used the Scalia test, which was what we call the uh, plurality decision in Rapanos. It did not command a majority of support. It commanded only four votes. Um, and the Scalia test is the one that the Trump rule primarily relies on, although in many ways, the Trump rule doesn't entirely endorse either the Scalia rule and certainly not the Kennedy rule. It's kind of a mongrel rule, or if you want, a bastard rule um, that's a little bit of both, but not enough of either to protect the waters of the United States. So that's a quick preview of the litigation uh, on WOTUS and a little bit of humor. This, of course, coming uh, from the opponents of the Obama rule. Let's go to Alaska. Wish we could. Bristol Bay. Um, this is a pristine, absolutely pristine watershed. One of the wonders of the world. Um, this is the world's largest sockeye salmon run. Um, over 60 million salmon ascend the waters of the Bristol Bay watershed. Um, it is a $1.5 billion fishery in terms of its commercial value. It has incalculable value to the native peoples of Alaska as for subsistence, um, for cultural and ceremonial and religious significance and all manner of other social values. It employs over 40,000 people. Um, so it's an incredibly important biological resource, a one of a kind resource, um, as well as an important economic resource. And wouldn't you know it, in the headwaters um, of Bristol Bay um, and the two big rivers, the Noshagak and the Vidak rivers and Ilama, Ilamna Lake, uh, they want to put this massive, biggest in the world copper mine with gold mining as a part of it. But the major uh, ore value in this massive area is copper um, right on top of the headwaters, which are absolutely pristine. This is totally undeveloped. There are no roads, no buildings, no uh, significant buildings, no significant development uh, of any kind. It's, it's truly a staggering industrial operation. The reserve the known deposits, as you see there, are over 10 billion tons of ore. The current plan is only to develop 1.2 billion tons of ore. But of course, once the mining begins, it'll go until either it's stopped in some way or the market changes for some of these copper products. Uh, but the ore is there for it to expand uh, even further beyond its already huge footprint. Just look at some of the statistics for this mine. It's an open pit mine, almost 2,000 feet deep, a mile long, a mile wide, 15 square miles of footprint, 6.4 square miles of wetlands destroyed or impacted in one form or another, filled or drained or degraded. You're going to need to build a massive road system into this area that's almost 100 miles long to carry the heavy trucks in and out. You're going to need a power plant to power the mine. You're going to need a 188-mile a, a pipeline bringing gas uh, to the electric generating facility that will be needed. You're going to need a deep water port in Kirk Cook Inlet to export all of this ore that's being uh, produced. You're, you're talking about 10.8 billion tons of these toxic uh, 
mine tailings, uh, the process that they're going to be using to mine this order, this ore, it used to be um, uh, leachate, uh, what they call heap leach mining process. The company's promising to use something less toxic, uh, but it, whatever it is, it will be chemical driven and result in an enormous amount there. You see uh, billions of gallons of wastewater that will have to be dealt with. Um, it's just an enormous industrial complex in the heart of one of the most important biological economic resources on the planet. Um, and the background, well, before I do this guy, um, the background here is the Obama administration EPA used um, one of the rarely used tools of the Clean Water Act, the 404C uh, authority, sometimes called the veto authority, which gives EPA the power to prohibit the use of sites for disposal of things like this mine tailings. Um, when the Corps of Engineers is proposing to issue a permit, which they are for this mine, EPA can step in and say no. They can either prohibit entirely the discharge and the permit for the discharge, or they can condition it. In the case of Pebble Mine, the Obama administration EPA, and this is Region 10 in Seattle, uh, actually did not prohibit any mining, but it put very, very strict conditions on what kinds of mining could occur. Uh, the restrictions were so uh, uh, stringent that the mining company said uh, mining the ore subject to these restrictions is not commercially feasible, at least to us. Um, and so we, uh, we, we can't proceed with the mine. Uh, the entire uh, Alaskan delegation, of course, is in support of the mine, although um, there have been concerns raised about all of the impacts that the mine is going to create. And, and um, you know, uh, the, the senators have weighed in and said, we want assurances that this mining operation can be done, quote, safely and all the rest. But nevertheless, um, the uh, mining company um, was able, of course, to convince the Trump administration to step in and withdraw the, Trump, the Obama administration's proposed 404C, quote, veto action. Um, and that is in litigation. Um, the Alaska District Court dismissed the challenge to the Trump administration's withdrawal of the 404C determination uh, ruling that that was a discretionary matter for the agency and not something that was subject to challenge under the Administrative Procedure Act. Committed to agency discretion is the doctrine invoked to dismiss the case. That case is on appeal to the Ninth Circuit, but it faces a very uphill battle. Uh, and in the meantime, the main event is really the Corps of Engineers permit. Um, and the Corps has done an environmental impact statement, um, and they have announced that they are going to issue the final environmental impact statement this month or next month. Uh, along with that, they'll issue what's called a record of decision. The ROD has to evaluate this, this mining proposal and the permit under what are called the 404B1 guidelines, which are developed by EPA and are the substantive standards against which a permit like this is measured. The interesting thing about those particular standards are they contain a number of prohibitions on activities that would violate water quality standards, that would impact endangered species, that would do unacceptable environmental harm, and so forth. So the thing to watch for with the Corps' record of decision document is how do they deal with all the very stringent standards embodied in the 404B guidelines. In other words, how do they get around them to the point where they can issue a permit? For sure, they're gonna have a lot of mitigation requirements in there, coming up with, quote, replacement resources for the wetlands that will be destroyed, and coming up with me measures of monitoring um, and enforcement to make sure that this tailings pile doesn't fail. And oh, by the way, this tailings pile we're talking about is going to be six stories high. 
That's the impoundment that's going to contain all of the toxic uh, mining waste um, for essentially eternity. The mining operation itself, this first phase, is going to take 20 years. Uh, but the, the, the residue from the mine, the legacy of the mine, will be there a lot longer. This is probably the most significant 404 case in history. Certainly in terms of the value of the resource at stake, um, and you overlay the environmental justice issues with all the native villages and corporations that are so dependent on this resource, it elevates it to the top tier of environmental cases. It will also, of course, carry over into the next administration. So even though we know the Trump administration is not going to uh, uh, deny this permit, or certainly EPA is not going to veto it. There's no indication EPA is prepared to do that. Um, we don't know what will happen if we get a new administration and a review of this whole thing. So that's Pebble Mine. And with the time, looking at the clock I have left, let me squeeze in one more action that just happened within the last week as our friend, uh, EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler. Uh, this is the headline from the Washington Post. EPA limits states and tribes' ability to protest pipelines and other energy projects. This is what we call the Section 401 Clean Water Act Water Quality Certification. This is an authority that Congress has invested in states. Um, it gives the states the power to veto or condition federal permits and licenses. Think for licenses, think Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, which licenses not only hydroelectric projects around the country, but gas pipelines, not oil pipelines, but gas pipelines. Um, and this 401 authority, which was written into the 1972 uh, Act, um, is the only way that the states have any leverage over federal permits like FERC licenses. Otherwise, state law is completely preempted, as the Supreme Court has ruled numerous times over the years. The other kind of federal permit that comes into play in even greater quantity is the Section 404 Dredge Fill Disposal Program administered by the Corps of Engineers. That program affects over 100,000 activities a year, some of which are permitted by nationwide or general permits, but a large number that have to get individual permits, just like the Pebble Mine we were talking about. So this is a huge deal for the states. This, is, this particular provision is their only authority to limit the damage that federally licensed projects uh, can have on their water quality and related uh, resources. Um, and EPA has now promulgated a rule for the first time. EPA has never had a rule implementing or interpreting the 401 authority. They've had guidance on the question, but never a rule before. And what's prompting this? Yeah, you guessed it. Fossil fuel infrastructure, like Keystone Pipeline, like the coal terminal in Washington state, like the LNG uh, terminal in Oregon, like the gas pipelines in New York, Virginia, West Virginia, um, the states have been using their 401 authority to either limit or in some cases outright deny federal, deny, I should say, certification for the federal permits and licenses that are required to construct all of this fossil fuel infrastructure. That's what got the president riled up, of course, and he issued an executive order to EPA fix it by coming up with a rule that limits the state's ability to block these energy dominance projects that the administration is so fond of. But the thing about pipelines is they leak. We saw the example of the Kinder Morgan uh, leak earlier. This is a leak from the Keystone Pipeline in eastern Montana, 350,000 gallons um, of nasty um, um, by bitumen is what it's called. It's, it's tar sands from Alberta, Canada, um, and it's really nasty stuff to deal with. So 
This is the law. This is Section 401. I've highlighted for you the critical issues here. This new rule is limiting both the timing of the state's exercise of this authority and the scope of what they can use the authority uh, to protect. So you see the language of the statute, um, the limit on the, the state's authority in certifying compliance with their water quality laws is if they fail or refuse to act on a request for certification within a reasonable period of time, not to exceed one year, their authority shall be deemed waived. So that's waiver by operation of law. If those pre uh, predicates uh, are not met, fail or refuse to act within a reasonable time, not to exceed one year of the request for the certification, you're deemed to have waived. So that's one set of critical language of the and text of the law that's at issue. The other question is in 401D, uh, and that is this reference uh, that Congress makes there, any certification provided under this section shall set forth effluent limitations, et cetera, and with any other appropriate requirement of state law set forth in such certification. So a fairly broad grant of authority to the states to not only certify compliance with these very formal effluent limitations, which are technology-based standards um, and other kinds of standards, like you see there, the 13, 16, those are new source performance standards. So not just those highly technical numerical uh, standards, but also any other appropriate requirement of state law designed to protect water quality um, is incorporated, encompassed within this 401 authority of the states. And the Supreme Court, in two very critical cases, has upheld uh, this very broad authority that the states have the most famous case is this one, PUD number one, Jefferson County versus Washington Department of Ecology. This is a FERC licensed new proposed hydroelectric dam on the Dosa Wallops River in Washington state. Um, and the state was trying to protect salmon habitat. They weren't just talking about strict effluent limitations, technology standards. They were talking about protecting the ecological values of the river. And they were worried not only about water quality, but water quantity, because without enough water, you don't have any fish. So they were looking at this in an ecological framework um, in a holistic way. And Justice O'Connor, in her very, very critical decision, upheld that authority. And you can see there how broadly she viewed it. A state may impose conditions on certifications insofar as necessary to enforce a designated use. So these are the uses that the states come up with for water resources. And in this case, they were talking about salmon habitat. That was one of the designated uses and all the parameters necessary to support a healthy population of salmon. So enforce a designated use contained in the state's water quality standard, which of course are approved by EPA and become federal standards and are reviewed every three years and revised and updated. Petitioners claim that the state may only impose water quality limitations specifically tied to a quote discharge. That's that technical term that we were talking about in the Maui case, the addition of a pollutant from a point source to a water of the United States by a person without a permit. All six of those requirements is what that term means, um, is contradicted by 401Ds reference to an applicant's compliance, which allows the state to impose other limitations. This view is consistent with EPA regulations providing that activities, not merely discharges, must comply with state water quality standards, a reasonable interpretation of a 401, which is entitled to deference. So that she's referring to what EPA's position was at that time when this decision was, when this case was, was decided. And that, that concept that you're not just looking at the end of the pipe impact, if you're looking at the total impact of the activity being licensed, the entire hydroelectric project, including the diversion canal, which takes water out of the river and runs it through the turbines before it returns it to the river, 
that has an impact in and of itself. It's a physical, uh, a physical impact on the river, not necessarily the discharge itself, but rather the impoundment and the construction of the diversion canal. So what does the current EPA say about this decision? The Supreme Court got it wrong. This is one of the first times in my career I've ever seen an agency literally say in its rulemaking, the Supreme Court got it wrong. And the EPA further says, and we are now taking a more holistic view of the statute and a modern view of the statute, can you believe it? And in our more modern holistic view, these concerns of the state must be limited to the direct effects of the discharge in absolute contradiction of Justice O'Connor's holding in the PUD number one case. Um, EPA has got a contorted explanation uh, for it. I commend it to you. It took them 289 pages in the preamble to this new rule to explain how the Supreme Court got it wrong, but not just once, but twice. So here's the S.D. Warren case uh, out of Maine. This was an existing hydroelectric project, so you weren't talking about a new discharge to build the dam. You were just talking about the continued operation of an existing dam, and all you were talking about here is the release of water through the dam, and did that constitute a discharge? And the Supreme Court, in a decision by Justice Souter, of course, New Hampshire boy, uh, ruled that, that Congress has two different definitions of discharge in the statute. One, discharge of a pollutant from a point source, that's very narrow. But secondly, another definition of a discharge, which is simply discharge without any limitation on addition of a pollutant from a point source. And Souter said that means even existing dams that are doing nothing more than passing water through them and through the turbines still require certification when FERC relicenses the dam. And of course, there's relicensing of these old dams going on all over the country right now. So Souter's decision says very clearly, we're not just talking about discharges of pollutants from point sources when we're talking about the state's authority under 401. And once again, along comes this new EPA rule and says, no, that's wrong for the same reasons that the Supreme Court got the PUD number one decision wrong, we think the Supreme Court got this one wrong. So quite a dramatic turn of events um, from our current EPA. I'll close by simply saying all of these cases and issues are in litigation. Um, that's good news for all of us lawyers, not such good news for the waters of the United States, for water quality, for the health of our rivers and wetlands and lakes and the biological resources that depend on them and the people and communities that depend on them. But it sure is gonna keep us all busy as lawyers with law degrees from Vermont Law School. So with that, let me stop. Let me get out of this screen and uh, see if we have some questions. Go ahead. Um, so we have a few minutes for folks to ask uh, Pat some questions from the audience. And as a reminder, for those of you watching on our website live stream, if you click on the video, you will see a chat box on the right side where you can add your question and we'll try and get through as many as possible. So the first question we have is, what do you think about EPA's response to the holding in PUD v. Washington Department of Ecology, do you think it will withstand scrutiny? I don't. Others disagree, of course. The key case is something called Brand X. And in Brand X, the United States Supreme Court did say that when a new administration comes to power, um, it's entitled to come up with new interpretations based on a change in circumstances. And what EPA is hanging its hat on in rejecting the holding in PUD is brand X. And this idea that um, 
you know, EPA at that time didn't challenge um, the state's interpretation of its authority, but that doesn't mean that EPA can't today challenge that interpretation. So the crux of the argument there is going to be, has EPA, the current EPA, come up with sufficient explanation for changes in circumstances to warrant a completely different interpretation of the scope of the 401 authority. And that's a question that might actually have to go all the way to the Supreme Court, unless, of course, a new administration comes to power and reverses this particular decision. I will say this is one of those rules that gets caught in what's called the Congressional Review Act. So if, um, by some great good fortune, um, not only does the Trump administration out of office, but the Democrats capture both the capture the Senate and hold the House. All it requires is a simple resolution passed in both houses to repeal a rule like this. It's caught in this Congressional Review Act process. Uh, so that's another potential outcome here. Okay. Next question. Do you see EPA issuing guidance or trying to develop a rule in response to Maui? Uh, yes. In fact, they were on that track when the case was pending in the Supreme Court. Um, and in Maui, again, the previous EPA had filed a brief in support of the plaintiffs, um, the Hawaii Wildlife Fund, saying, yeah, we think the Maui case is one of those where a permit should be required. Um, and so EPA has flipped uh, on that uh, position. And in the context of doing that, they promised to uh, issue new guidance uh, on what constitutes um, or when a discharge through groundwater would be regulated. And the proposal that they put for us was never. EPA's historic position has been if there's a direct hydrological connection between the point source discharge through groundwater and surface water, it requires a permit. The current EPA is proposing to reverse that interpretation and position and say that discharges through groundwater can never be subject to a permit requirement. Problem there is the Supreme Court decisively rejected that in Maui. I mean, they didn't even give that argument the time of day when it was made in the oral argument. So I'm not sure what the Trump administration is going to be able to do about the Maui case. I think we're going to be looking at the lower court sorting this out for now. And how do you think the Maui case will impact other common indirect discharge sources, such as the agricultural sector? That has come up. People have asked about tile drains, uh, which are used throughout farming country, particularly in the Midwest. Iowa comes to mind, but it's everywhere. It's even in Vermont. Um, and, um, you know, that's an interesting question because tile drains are, you know, they're things, they're objects. They're, they're, they look like big uh, pipes, which drain wetlands and sort of, you know, dewater fields so that they can be cultivated, and it results in tremendous pollution. Nitrate pollution has caused serious problems for drinking water, for example, in the city of Des Moines, Iowa. Um, so some people are speculating that this functional equivalent test could maybe reopen questions about things that, frankly, most of us didn't really think were going to be regulated as point sources. But if this time and distance uh, concept it becomes the controlling test that the lower courts use, well, then that means anytime you can look at a, at a, a defined discrete conveyance, whether it's a tile drain or a pipe or whatever it is, it's a human contrivance that's transporting pollutants via the groundwater into the surface water. If time and distance considerations means it's happening relatively quickly, in relative close proximity, you, you could actually be seeing an expansion 
uh, of the indirect discharge permit program. And I'm not predicting that, but clever lawyers are certainly going to be pushing the envelope on that. I'm already hearing that. And um, I know, Pat, that you are um, you follow these issues and climate issues, not just in the U.S., but internationally. How would you say that this evolution in water law compares to what other countries are doing um, with the regulation of water pollution? Yeah, good question. Uh, kind of hard to encapsulate the whole thing. I was in Ireland, so I got a chance to see the European European Union approach to lots of different environmental issues, including water quality. The European nations make very heavy use of effluent charges, at least in terms of their mechanism for dealing with identifiable sources of pollution. When it comes to non-point pollution, which is the biggest problem we have, runoff, um, it varies tremendously uh, from country to country, just looking at, at the what is it, 29 nations of the European Union. A, a lot of countries have gone in and restored wetlands, restored buffers, um, focusing more on natural systems uh, as the primary means of reducing pollution. That's something that obviously we're, we're doing to some extent in the United States. Uh, I, I don't think the other countries, certainly in Europe, they, they do have large factory farms uh, like we do, but I didn't get a sense that they were as massive uh, as some of the ones that we have or that the kinds of water quality problems they were creating were as acute uh, as some of these these massive hog farms in North Carolina, for example. Um, I, I don't know that there's anybody in the world that's really got a handle on, on this water quality issue to the extent that you could point to it and say that's what we should do. There are just elements in different parts of the world um, that are useful to look at, best practices kinds of things to look at. But unless and until um, we get a more robust program for investing in controlling non-point sources, and that really means fundamentally changing the systems by which we produce food, frankly, much more than these Band-Aid approaches of trying to control the pollution once these massive facilities are in place. You know, it gets down to things like diet, right? I mean, if you want to really limit the damage that factory farms do, eat less meat. It, it, it's not very complicated. Um, you know, and plant-based foods are gaining ground. Um, I'm eating them myself these days. So, um, you know, there, there, there's no simple answer to that really good question, Jenny, but I, I'm sure there are lessons to be learned everywhere in the world for how to do this right. Okay, great. Um, so unfortunately we have to wrap up. We um, have folks who are gonna be heading to class for one o'clock, both professors and students. Um, so thank you so much, Pat, and um, thank you to everyone who submitted questions and participated today. Our next Hot Topics talk is going to take place on June 11th, and we hope that you can join us then. In the meantime, hang in there, everybody, and we'll hope to see you next time. Thanks. Take care, everyone. See ya.